Good morning, my name is Dave Cooper from Lex UK, the Lift and Escalator Consultancy and the University of Northampton. As many of you will be aware, I've researched escalator accidents for many years. Much of my research has gone deep into specific subjects such as falls over the sides of escalators, side of step entrapment and accidents involving shopping trolleys on escalators. Also, I presented a paper last year on escalator runaways. This paper comes back to the surface and goes wide rather than deep into the matter of the passenger contribution to escalator accidents. This Venn diagram was created by Dr. Lutfi Al Sharif, who coincidentally is chairing today's session. Throughout my research, I found myself repeatedly coming back to this Venn diagram. He identified three inputs to escalator accidents design, maintenance, inspection and operation, and passenger behaviour, each of which have their own circle in the Venn diagram. It is very rare, but not unknown, for a component failure to be involved in an accident. However, design and human actions are often dual components that come together to create an unhappy outcome. I'm going to look at two cases where the passenger behaviour combined with either the design or maintenance came together to create a situation where an accident occurred. Case 1 involved a passenger called Mr Valenti. He was aged 42 and was on a night out in Atlantic City in September 2009. He was with his friend in the food hall on the upper mall of a shopping centre. Both of them had drunk alcohol, but weren't drunk. The victim's friend stumbled as he got on the escalator, which pushed Mr Valenti and he fell over the side. The claim was brought by the victim's family. The case settled out of court with the escalator manufacturer taking a percentage of the claim. The significant facts to note were there had been a fatality on the same escalator in the same way a few months before. The handrail was only 960 millimetres high. There was a void exposing a fall of three floors. Furthermore, no risk assessment was undertaken after the first fatality. The scene was untouched from the first fatality as well. No remedial action had been taken. The architect, m and &E consultant, security company and the escalator manufacturer all shared the cost of the claim. Case 2 was in Glasgow. The argument centred around whether the claimant was actually holding onto the handrail or not. The case became slightly comical at one point because the claimant was also claiming for not only his injuries, but for a curry that he had dropped and a pair of sunglasses that got broken. The maintenance of the escalator was poor. There was a lot of discussion in the court, because this case went to trial, about the left and the right hand side of an escalator. And it became apparent that there was confusion uh, because some people were going left and right from the top and some from left and right from the bottom. The case went to trial. The escalator was alleged to have to have jerked and as a result the um, passenger lost his balance. Uh, in court the claimant lost his claim. The purpose of this paper is to identify examples of passenger behaviours that contribute to escalator accidents. In cases where passenger accidents have been either causative or contributory to the accident they can generally be categorised into two forms intended misuse and unintended misuse. This categorization is troublesome as some may argue that a person getting on an escalator with luggage or using a walking stick would not be aware of the potential risk of a runaway suitcase causing a cascade fall or a walking stick tip under load being across the joint between two steps when they go into transition. The troublesome element is when a passenger repeats the same unintentional error and a similar accident occurs where a further risk category can be introduced of willful negligence. Owners very often rely on CCTV footage when defending legal actions, and this can be extremely helpful in any analysis post-accident. The following photographs refer. Looking at some of the examples I've listed in my paper, I would normally engage in an interactive debate with the audience at this point and try and derive their opinions. But because we aren't phys physically together this year, it means that isn't possible. 
I will give you my take on some of the examples I have given in the paper, but these are by no means exhaustive. This wheelchair user is intending to board the escalator. Misuse from our perspective as an industry, yes. From her perspective as a wheelchair user, she may be totally unaware of what was about to happen. There is always a backstory. Was this the first time she'd done this? Was there a lift nearby? Was the lift advertised? Was the lift working? To me, this photograph represents high jinks and is obviously influenced by peer pressure. To us in the industry, I imagine we would all agree this is misuse. To them, they must understand its misuse, but they may not be aware of the potential outcome of any accident, especially when they all plop into a pile at the top as they go over the newel end. This one is interesting as it may not be what it seems. As I said earlier, there is normally a backstory. Has this young lad deliberately put himself onto the handrail for the purposes of entertainment? Or has he been picked up by the handrail at the newel end and is just holding on? There is a fine line here between the passenger contribution and the design. Consideration also needs to be given to the age of the lad. In Carl White's paper, Court Cases of Consequence, it is identified that duty holders owe a greater duty of care to young children and those that require great, greater protection. A question I would ask here is, does the handrail need to be exposed at the newel end? This is a clear example of misuse and is a game that became popular for a while. Clearly there is no consideration to what may happen if he can't get off at the top end. But look at the parallels with this video where the modus operandi is similar but not intentional. This passenger is clearly having difficulty with her luggage trolley. There are a number of issues here. What if she is unable to maintain the strength to hold the trolley? It would certainly cause injury to herself and possibly others behind her. What if the trolley came in contact with the balustrade or skirt and rotated and became wedged? And what would the outcome be if the escalator stopped and she had to hold on to the trolley until assistance arrived? This one draws a fine line. Is it misuse at all? There are certain things in life that don't pair well together. Alcohol and cars being one, soft shoes and escalators being another. These photographs were taken during a test to try and establish what was going on with soft soled shoes when there was a spate of injuries a few years ago. Is it misuse? I would say not because the person wearing these shoes had no idea what the outcome of that journey would be. However, as an industry, we are aware of it. This is another one that falls into a similar category for me. This young passenger bent down to pick up a coin she had dropped on the escalator and her hair went between the steps and became entangled. It subsequently tightened up to a point where the hair was ripped from her head. Similar accidents are known to happen with long flowing clothes becoming entangled in handrails. This slide shows a slide from a, a legal um, training course and it asks the question about duty of care. Was the damage or harm reasonably foreseeable? If the ordinary reasonable person could not foresee the damage to the defendant, a duty of care is not owed. In our case, as an industry, we aren't ordinary reasonable people, we are professionals. We've designed escalator systems we have standards, uh, and in particular BS 5656 Part 2, 2004, in which there is a requirement upon us to undertake a risk assessment for the location of an escalator before we install it. A way of preventing accidents is education and or signage. However, even such an approach can be criticized. 
it could be construed that you are actually educating the person to misbehave and if they are of an adventurous character it may promote miscreant behavior signage can actually be uh, criticized as being an invitation to misbehave and where do you stop when it comes to pointing out potential hazards signage is very often ignored by a passenger and is often used in a legal argument to simply say we pointed out the risk in advance in 115 part 1 Annex G introduces some standard signage that should be posted, which is limited to four signs. G1, small children should be held firmly. G2, dogs shall be carried. Not sure what you do if you haven't got a dog. G3, use the handrail. G4, push chairs not permitted. This is very limiting and does not cover many of the passenger contribution to accidents. One of the issues I have with escalators is very often um, owners are inconsistent in, where, in how they approach things, um, locations of stop buttons, signage and so on. Owners of escalators for many years inter have introduced their own signage, um, especially for risk post accident. This is an interesting sign found in a retail outlet and introduces a warning that I have only ever seen on this particular escalator in as much as people with pacemakers are advised to use the lift. You can also see the lower text which conflicts with the message given in the pictograms above where push chairs are prohibited. But the text goes on to say that babies and toddlers must be securely strapped to seats. Having investigated accidents where children have actually fallen out of buggies and fallen down escalators, um, I totally agree with the, the notion that push chairs and uh, should not be allowed on escalators. There are things we can do as an industry. This is a picture of some new handrail signage on escalators at London Bridge Station. Network Rail should be applauded for this initiative of printing Hold Me on the handrail as it resolves two issues simultaneously. The Hold Me text clearly indicates to passengers to hold the handrail. But the fact that the text is moving with the handrail means that it also provides a handrail mo motion indicator. Clearly there is a discussion to be had about a visually impaired person using an escalator, but I'm interested in seeing data post-COVID for people that have fallen on escalators. Many are now paranoid, paranoid about holding a handrail as it may harbour germs. And at the same time, passenger numbers have reduced to a point that getting a me meaningful data set for analysis will be difficult. What I am certain of is that mobile phone usage in escalator accidents will feature in some research at some stage. There are other things we can do, including education. There are two very good programs. This one is an educational program introduced by Lear, the Lift and Escalator Industry Association in the UK. Liam Loves Escalators is a children's storybook and poster. It continues the story of Liam, the inquisitive little boy from the first story which involved lifts. Liam is now a few years older and children will get to join him in his latest adventure as he learns about the do's and don'ts of using escalators through a series of fabulously fun illustrations. In the United States they have a similar program called the Safety Rider run by the Elevator and Escalator Safety Foundation. Their program has two great ways for children to learn. The best and easiest method is to have a child visit the Safety Riders org website. The second is by requesting paper learning packets, which include an activity page, a certificate and a sticker. In addition to educating passengers, especially young children, you can also educate people who work in the vicinity of escalators. This is a cutting from the SAFED EMW document, which was updated in 2018. Staff training is featured here in, in section 4.14. Companies and organizations responsible for the safe use of escalator and moving walks should ensure that their employees are adequately instructed and informed about the safe use of the escalator or moving walk and the hazards arising from their unsafe use and should also be familiar with emergency procedures. Line managers and other relevant staff should be adequately trained and given sufficient instruction and information on the need to, 
discourage children and young people playing on or near an escalator or moving walk, and warning people who are using an escalator or moving walk in an unsafe manner. Before I finish, I will leave you with this footage caught on CCTV of a near miss. As I said earlier, component failures are very rare, and this escalator appears to have given no indication it was in trouble prior to the event, and nor does, does it appear to have been any passenger causation involved in what you've just seen. Thank you for listening to this presentation. If you have any questions, please raise them during the Q&A session. Uh, alternatively, do feel free to email me.